podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and I will be speaking to you today about the Epistle Lesson for Reformation Day. Uh, we typically observe Reformation Day on the Sunday close to where it falls, and the Epistle Lesson is a wonderful one to preach on. Why? Because Romans chapter 3 is a very frequently cited passage uh, in our Lutheran confessions. It was very important testimony uh, from the scriptures that was used by our Reformation fathers in confessing the truths that they were um, defending and arguing for at the time of the Reformation. So even though we may often preach in the Gospel lesson, Reformation Day does give us a wonderful opportunity to preach on the Epistle lesson, uh, namely today from Romans chapter 3 verses 19 to 28 because there Paul confesses uh, very clearly the uh, universal nature of sin, but also the universal nature of the justification of the world that's happened in Jesus Christ. A wonderful truth that was vigorously defended by the Reformation and that it's so important that we continue to proclaim with clarity in the world today. Let's move to the Greek text. And if we go to our board here, we see right away... Um, Paul, in these opening two verses, is basically summarizing important testimony that began at, uh, at 118, namely uh, where Paul is talking about the, uh, the unrighteousness of all humanity, and it goes all the way down to our, our text, namely 320. So Paul builds a very elaborate argument about the unrighteousness of Gentiles, the unrighteousness of Jews, and, and then summarizes it that there is no one righteous, not even one. All have sinned, all are, are lacking, and all of that climaxes now in these two verses. And that's why Paul says, he begins verse 19, we know why do we know that? We've just heard the scripture that he's quoted, and especially from the Psalms and the verses of chapter 3 leading up to this, as well as his whole argument from 118 forward. So we know that whatever here the law says, then you go forward to get the verb here, it says, third person singular, it says to the ones who are here, it's in, or we can understand this as under the law, namely they are in the law in the sense of under the law's condemnation. So whatever the law says, it says to the ones who are under the law, all humanity is under the law. And you can see the inclusiveness of these words here with different forms of pas, in order that every mouth, there's nobody that can defend themselves in light of what scripture says about our state as human beings apart from the grace of God, apart from the work of Jesus Christ. So every mouth uh, be stopped. So you have the hina plus the subjunctive verb here. And uh, you see that. And then the second subjunctive verb is genetai. So you have the hina plus the two subjunctive verbs. The first verbal action is in order that every mouth be stopped. It's sort of like a courtroom. You have no defense. You have to just shut your mouth because there's nothing you can say in your defense. That's basically what Paul is saying uh, because the law testifies to our sinfulness. Uh, and then uh, it, it emphasizes that the whole world, again, that inclusive that inclusive term and this inclusive term, not just Gentiles, not just Jews, all the world, every human being, um, become or be accountable right here to God. So we all, um, no matter if we were born with the uh, born um, with knowledge of the law in the sense that Jews had the, the, the revealed word of God or were Gentiles, we're all held accountable to God. And there's nothing that we can do in the sense of uh, pointing to any righteousness uh, in our own sa sakes. Uh, so all mouths are shut and uh, all are held accountable to, um, to God. 
And then he continues on with this summary of all of the um, argument he's built in chapters 1, 2, and 3 uh, up to this point because he uh, goes on with this statement, deity, because X, on account of the works of the law, and then he uses this phrase, u pasa sarx. This is an idiom. So it basically says, not all flesh, namely no human being. That not even one, not all flesh simply means not one human being. So no one future passive verb here will be declared righteous. Now you'd actually have the beginning of all this language of righteousness right here. No one will be declared righteous um, before him uh, on account of the works of the law. Because we have fallen short, nobody has, has the opportunity to be declared righteous because of what they have done. Um, and that puts us all in the same boat of needing God's grace. The wonderful truth of the Reformation is uh, we are saved by grace alone. And the, it's because of this situation. We all are under the condemnation of the law. We all are totally dependent upon the grace of God. And that point is driven home right here at the end of verse 20. Uh, because what does the law do? Uh, for through the law, right here, namely through the revealed moral law of God and his word, um, comes the knowledge of sin, or is the knowledge of sin. The verb to be is understood here, the verb I me. So, for through the law is knowledge, uh, epinosis, of sin. This is really then what we would call the second use of the law. It's a primary function of the law. Um, the law um, is the mirror through which we come to the knowledge of sin. It's an important function of the law to convict us of sin. So this, these two verses really are summarizing the argument of Paul from earlier, and they basically set up then what he begins in verse 21. There's a huge shift here in the text. And he, he signals it with this nuni. Uh, now, apart from the law. So he's talked a lot about what the law does in revealing God's will and it, it convicts us of our sin. Uh, it's not a way in which we can become righteous before God. That's a condemnation of, of the kind of um, abuse of the law that was going on within Judaism where people would say we're, we're, we enter the covenant through grace, but we remain in the covenant through what we do in terms of being obedient to the law. No, we enter through grace, we stay in through grace. That's Paul's message. And that's certainly the message for the church today. We don't, just don't enter by grace and then stay in through what we do. No, uh, we enter and stay in God's gracious covenant, God's gracious uh, um, state of salvation, by grace alone. So apart from the law, very clear statement, the righteousness of God. He's had the verb here uh, in verse 20. Here is this beautiful noun. It's a prominent Old Testament noun in terms of Isaiah, talking about the righteousness of God as saving us. And here you have a perfect tense verb. So the righteousness of God has already been revealed and continues to be revealed. Perfect tense is emphasizing past action, ongoing result. When was the righteousness of God revealed? It was revealed in the person of Jesus and it continues to be in the state of being revealed. Why? Because the gospel message testifies to the righteousness of God revealed in Jesus. So it continues to be in this state of you can see that the epiphany word here with pifana rotai, uh, it continues to be in the state of being manifested, being revealed. And, and where is it testified to? Being born witness. Here you have the participle by the law and the prophets. Again, here's the, the unique use of the word uh, uh, law and the prophets in the sense of speaking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, especially a text like Isaiah, testifies 
And there are so many places that testify to the righteousness of God. And again, this is an important modifier. It's saying it's not a righteousness that belongs to us. It's a righteousness that exclusively belongs to God. And it's also, one can understand this, this is a title for what the Son, who, this, who God is in the Son. He, the Son is the righteousness of God, especially now the incarnate Son who has shown God's righteousness in what he has done in coming into our world, in living for us, uh, that perfect righteous life, dying for the unrighteous so that the benefits of his righteousness can be shared with us, the unrighteous ones. So all of that is be being testified to by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, here again, you have that same phrase used, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus. Literally, this phrase is the faith of Jesus. And sometimes it's translated faith in Jesus, which is the typical way that Luther and others have, have translated. It also could be understood um, not as the, an objective genitive with Christ as the object of the faith, but it could be understood as a subjective genitive. It's actually speaking about the faith of Jesus as in his faithfulness. So the righteousness of God revealed in what Jesus has done in faithfully obeying, faithfully dying, faithfully rising again for our salvation. Uh, either way, the emphasis is that God's righteousness has to do with what Christ has done through the faith or faithfulness uh, in Christ. And then to all the ones, here I would say is a very clear emphasis on our faith, namely the Holy Spirit having worked faith. So the righteousness of God is revealed to all the ones who are believing. Uh, when, when the Holy Spirit works faith, then we see the righteousness of God in Jesus. We see it as the righteousness that we need uh, is available and won for us in Christ and given as a free gift. So to all the ones who are believing this righteousness of God is seen and then also received. And then, uh, for there is no distinction right here, Paul, in a sense, is restating what he's already said in verses 19 and 20. He says there's no distinction. Again, that language of pas, we saw the inclusiveness of the condemnation up here. It comes out again here. Uh, with pontes, for all, here's your subject, here's your verb, all uh, have sinned and participle are lacking the glory of God. We were created in the image of God, but because of the fall, everyone is lacking. All are lacking the glory of God. Why? Because we've sinned with Adam's sin. This is chapter 5 of Romans. All have sinned. And then this subject is then the subject of the participle that follows. And this is an important truth because here you have objective or also can be understood as universal justification is taught. Namely, all sin, that's universal sin, and all are justified here, how? Um, as a gift, right here, this is grace language. Grace language is brought out very explicitly here. As a gift through his grace, by his grace, right here. The language, the dative, by means of his grace. And what, how did that grace, that gracious gift come to us of being justified? Through the ransom or through the payment that uh, the one that is in Christ Jesus. That's a reference, a wonderful reference to the atonement offered in Jesus' death. So you have that language there of ransom or payment. Uh, redemption is another way that we can, um, we can express that. It's, it's uh, the wonderful language we stress uh, about God paying the price that we owe 
through Jesus' death. His death is a payment, uh, a redemption, a, um, an atonement sacrifice for us, for our sins. And it, it's making it very clear that it's the one happened in Jesus. All of the sacrifices of the Old Testament are pointing forward to the one that happened in Jesus. Whom, and it's speaking obviously of Christ Jesus here, whom God, here's your subject, here's your verb, put forward as an illustration. This is the language of the mercy seat. It's the very language used in the Septuagint for the mercy seat sacrifice. The blood was poured out in the Day of Atonement. And, and basically what Paul is saying is Christ payment right here was, was the mercy seat sacrifice. It is the, in a sense, his blood is the blood that, that actually atones for the sins of all of the world. Any blood poured out before that on the mercy seat was, in a sense, pointing forward to this once and for all sacrifice as Hebrew expresses it. Hebrews expresses it. Okay? Through the, through the faithfulness in his blood. Through, here you have the emphasis of blood. How did the, uh, how did the ransom take place? Uh, how does the, this mercy seat sacrifice take place? Obviously, here, speaking of the pouring out of Jesus' blood, uh, the focus on Calvary's cross, the Lord's Supper testifies to that death, that atoning, bloody death, uh, every time we celebrate it. And so here, the, the focus of, of, in a sense, explicitly mentioning blood as the source of the payment. Uh, in order to show his righteousness, so this is how God shows his righteousness to the world is in what he does in pouring out the blood of his son for the payment of the sins of the world. Uh, and uh, here in verse 25, uh, he's talking about the, um, to show his righteousness on account of, dia, on account of the uh, previously passed over sins. Namely, all past sins that are, are really atoned for in this action. God did not punish sin, the past sins, until all sin was punished in Jesus. That what Jesus did is the source of the forgiveness that he offered all through history, if you will. And that's what that is stressing. And then verse 26, you have in the forbearance right here, this is an emphasis of the, the grace of God, the forbearance of God, of not you know, punishing sin as it's, uh, as it's being uh, committed, but rather um, being uh, a patient and loving and gracious and then punishing sin in history in the person of his son at Calvary's cross. Uh, in order to show right here, uh, again, the emphasis of his righteousness. Uh, in Jesus, we see God's righteousness. He does not, uh, and it's a gracious righteousness. He does not give us what he deserves, but he rather, uh, he rather uh, focuses the punishment of sin within himself, specifically upon the Son. Um, uh, in the... Uh, here, right here, the Chiron emphasizing the unique time that Jesus was, um, was put to death for our salvation. Um, and, and then you have the emphasis in order to himself. Here you have ice, ta, plus the infinitive. Uh, right here, uh, Ainai. In order for himself to be righteous, so he's showing what, that he, what his nature is uh, as the righteous and holy God and, and a gracious God and to declare righteous the ones who are having faith. So again, that language of the ones who are believing that we saw earlier re-emphasized here with the emphasis of who is it that actually benefits from the universal justification? It's the ones who are individually um, uh, justified. So here you have universal justification uh, earlier uh, in verse um, 20, 
you, you, uh, you have in 24, all have sinned, all are justified. Here you have more of the emphasis on individual or subjective justification, that we are individually justified the moment we are brought to faith, we receive the benefits of that universal action. Why don't we scroll up here to um, these bottom verses as we get to verse 27 and following. So we finish out this text. And thus, Paul says, um, um, yeah, and it's the one who has faith, I should say, uh, right here, uh, in Christ. Uh, the object of faith is highlighted in the end of verse 26. And then in verse 21, uh, so what is therefore the boasting? Keep in mind, Jews boasted about what they did to stay in the covenant. They boasted about their obedience to law. Paul uses the same term to remind us that we don't have anything to boast of in terms of our work. We boast in the Lord and what, what work he has done. So that's why he says, it has been excluded. So any boasting out of our own is excluded. We have no grounds to, to put anything before the Lord because it's the righteousness of Jesus that's our source of salvation, not any inherent righteousness that we have because we are all sinners and are unrighteous uh, with, apart from faith. So and he says uh, right here, um, on, on account of what principle here? On account of what law? Literally, it's law. But here, I would say it'd be better to translate this principle, uh, namely, on what law in the sense of what principle? On the principle of works? And then, uki, no. Namely, we cannot uh, boast on a principle or on the, the of, of works. No, but... Uh, on account of the principle law here of faith. So what do we boast in? We boast not, um, uh, our own boasting is excluded because by works of the law, no one is declared righteous, but through faith. And here's where, again, the emphasis on, on the Holy Spirit working faith in our hearts, being saved by faith, alone, Luther brought that out in the Reformation. He, even though Paul doesn't use the word alone, that's the, the essence of what he is teaching. He is emphasizing that it's only by faith, not by faith and works, not by faith and our righteous deeds that we're saved, but by faith alone. And that's really what Paul is stressing uh, here and certainly brings this out nicely in the closing verse of our text. For we reckon... He starts off earlier, we know, here he concludes with this language of, in light of the evidence, we reckon that, uh, uh, to, that we are justified, right here, to be justified by faith. So we reckon that a man is justified by faith, and here we would stress faith alone, apart from the works of the law. Namely, it is not our sanctification that somehow plays a role uh, in our, in our sta being saved, but our justification, which is all by grace through Christ, uh, and that's given by faith alone. So, wonderful testimony to these Reformation truths that, um, uh, that were drawn so prominently from a text like this and we see uh, confessed by the church today uh, as we hold up uh, what the scriptures teach about grace alone, about faith alone, about our salvation through Christ alone. Uh, we certainly pray that the Lord will bless your proclamation of this wonderful Reformation truth from the words of the scriptures that Paul has uh, written for us uh, on this Reformation Day anew.